Okay, guys. Um, thank you to everyone for coming to, to this afternoon's uh, session. So today we have Shelley uh, Shakaborshi, who's a doctoral student here in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. Shelley's just back from a course in Greece where she uh, studied the global burden of disease study methodology and she's going to share some of the lessons that you learned today. So hopefully we'll have time for comments and questions at the end. So over to Shelley. Hi everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the Global Burden of Disease Study Methodology, the lessons I learned there. And it's going to be short, but not very short. I'm just going to be a little brief about the methodology because not everybody here would be interested in the methodology, but an overview of what I actually learned there. Oops. So this was a course which was organized by the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, University of Washington, Seattle in Greece last month. And I attended this course because my PhD surrounds around the burden of disease and I'm working on the burden of disease and not specifically non-communicable diseases. So this was a part of my training. So what is the aim and the purpose of this presentation? So the aim and the purpose, I think, is to just familiarize everybody about what the Global Burden of Studies group looked like, what their methodologies were, and to share with you what I actually learned there, the scientific approach behind the GBD study. So just to give you a bit of the history about GBD. So GBD came into 1990 when the World Development <coughs> Report came into being. That was the Investing in Health Report. That was the first policy from the health point of view which brought about a global attention into hidden and neglected health challenges. Before that, there was no comprehensive report on the health challenges across the world. Then, then came the improvement in GBD 2010, which was a more comprehensive GBD update. And Previously, in 1990, you had only the World Health Organization and Harvard working together, whereas in 2010, there were 500 experts across the world who came together, and it was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 2013 came into more expansion of estimates, methodologies, data sets, and also they had 1,000 researchers across 100 different countries. So this was the most comprehensive estimate ever around the world so that they could have a comprehensive comprehensive understanding of what the health system across the world is. So just to make a little bit familiar to the faces, so the GBD team originated with Christopher Murray and Alan Lopez. They were the founding members and they were very good friends. So uh, Christopher Murray is from Howard and Alan Lopez is from the School of Public Health in Melbourne. They're very good friends and Theo Voss and Mohsen Nagavi were people who were actually working together with them. Professor Nagavi was a person who actually started the burden of disease study in Iran back in 1980s. And when the Harvard started this initiative of burden, they wanted Mohsen Nagavi to move to them. And now they're working all together. Emanuela is the person who organized this training. She was the person, and she's also from Harvard as well. And now she moved to IHM, and she is the wife of Christopher Murray. So that's the story. And now, what's going to go happen in the next 30 minutes is I'm going to take you through why we're talking about GBD, what the methods mean and how they are done. Very easy methods with examples so that it's e easy for everybody to understand and not so statistical. And this, I'll take you through cause of death estimation, the years of life lost, non-fatal burden as yours lived with disability, comparative risk assessment framework, risk attribution, how they forecast and what future progress we are supposed, to, we are going to take into. So. You might be thinking, why am I talking about GBD? Why is GBD so interesting? There are different other methods which we can talk about. So GBD is interesting because we, we need to know what the ill health, which is improving, which is getting better. If we don't know that, then where do we invest? How does the policy come into form? And we also need to know what are the main causes of health loss in our country, a country neighborhood, so that we know where we stand in terms of our health conditions. And what did GBD do? So GBD did brought about all the data together and decided upon one metric that was the disability adjusted life years. That was a disability and tried to compare all countries together. <coughs> and how, do, how could you do this? So you might be thinking, oh, it's easy to say whichever is the most problematic risk factor, pick it up. But what do we do with it? Like we have to have something to do with it. What can you do if you're a researcher like me? Or what can you do if you're in a foundation or in a government? So UK did something which we can also do. 
So what the UK government, Public Health England did, was they worked with IHME in very close collaboration. The minister, the health minister, talked to IHME and said, we want you to tell us where we are lagging behind, where we are in terms of UK, where we are in terms of the other European countries, the US, the Australia, where are we? Do we really rank above them, below them? Where are we? So this was the work which was published in Lancet in 2010, where they said what was UK's health performance, and they really saw that UK was lagging behind a lot of countries. And how they did this? So this was done in this way. So first what they did was, I'll just give you a simple overall example, it's not very detailed. So <clears throat> they took all the drug use, and they saw in 2013 how males and females disabilities due to drug use. They saw that males had a higher disabilities because of drug use as compared to females on the right. What they did next was they saw the age specific mortality by sex. So the red line is the females and the blue line is for the males. So that's the age specific mortality where you see overall males are having a higher mortality as compared to females except for the age 30-34. Then they, what they did, they ranked UK as compared to the other EU countries. So how do you understand that? So I probably need to go there. So if you see here, at 1 to 4, you see that UK is at rank 7 when you compare them to all the other countries. If you see 5 to 9, for 1990, it's a third rank. Then it's at 6 ranks. So you see the rank is actually to here, like for 75, 79 in 2010 was 11 and so on. So these are the ranks which they compared across for different countries to see where they rank. So the observations, what the observations did they have? So they saw that deaths and disabilities from drug use disorders have risen over the years. Drugs and alcohol are very prominent causes of ill health. And what was the result of all this? All the graphs, all the stories behind this. The result was the government started considering results of this study and a public consultation on a minimum pricing of alcohol. So such a thing like graphs, numbers, they went to a policy perspective. So that was what IHME intervened into, that only numbers don't matter. You can't do anything with numbers. You have to have that number into a format which people can understand, a government can understand, a policy person can understand. So how they did everything was they had the, uh, the world divided into seven regions, seven geographic regions. That was the high income region, Latin America, Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, Oceania, and Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. So that was the basic outline of the seven world geographic regions where they did all the analysis. Now I'll move into the different estimation procedures and I'll give you an example at each end of the procedure so that you know what's going on. So causes of death. Why do we want to know about cause of death? Like what is the interest of everybody to know about cause of death? So cause of death is a fundamental matrix of population health. It's even in normal life. If somebody comes and tells you, you know what, my friend died yesterday. What's the first question you ask? What happened to her? Right, so that is what you're interested in. You're interested in what happened to that person. So that is a population metric in itself. You want to know what caused that death. And you, that is not only a an interest of just health metrics. It's also about comparability across countries. So if you want to know how many deaths are occurring in UK and Ireland, you have to compare that. If you don't have certain metrics to compare across countries, how do you know which country is improving in terms of death or disability or whatever? And how do we quantify that? One is absolute numbers. Everybody knows add up all the deaths and it gives you how many deaths. Next is the rate. How many people are dying per 100,000 or per 1,000 population? So that is how you represent death. And the other is cost fraction. So what is cost fraction? Cost fraction is number of deaths from one particular risk factor or a, like for here, transport injuries death in Australia divided by all the particular diseases or deaths from all particular diseases in, that, in Australia. So that's the cost fraction. And what is death? What is death? End of life? No. So what I define death, that is not a single event. So death is multiple events combined together. It can never be one single event. What do I mean by that? People, use, you people say, oh, one cause, one death is from only one cause. But it's never like that. You can never have one death from one single cause. There might be one cause which is the one you see. 
the one which is immediate but there are underlying causes as well which work simultaneously to tell you oh yeah that person didn't die just of heart attack there are multiple factors working so i'll give you an example as to why i'm telling this see this is a death certificate of a 66 year old woman and when the person died it was written oh she died of cardiac arrest at 11 a.m september 12 but there are other secondary co consequences which she had gone through there was septicemia and 10 years ago she was diagnosed with breast cancer so she apparently died from cardiac arrest but there were multiple causes which worked in together not only cardiac arrest so that's what i wrote at the, at the bottom this does not mean that the mode of dying is heart failure it means disease injuries complicated the stuff that caused that together so it's everything working together so where did IHME get the data sources from? They had multiple data sources. They have a huge data set. So they had vital registries, population registers, cancer uh, censuses and surveys, verbal autopsy. So verbal autopsy is like talking to their family to get information. If a person has died, how do you, you talk to them and ask them, oh, what was the problem with him? How long was he suffering, etc. Surveillance systems, hospital records, burial mortuary, as well as police records. So to see where we are, tiny island there. So. We can see that we are quite ahead of a lot of countries, but we're still not as ahead as some of the parts of Europe as well. So you see that we have only the recent data until 2012. And there are a lot of countries which still have recent data after 2015. So we need to move. And availability and completeness of data, we have complete data. That's a very good thing. We have extensive, complete, representative of vital registration data. You can see the parts of sub-Saharan Africa where there is absolutely no complete data. It's all in yellow and all in orange and red. Like, you will not find a little bit of that. Like, that red part over here, this red part, this is Somalia. It actually has no data across any time period, it has no data. So there are parts of the world where there is no data. The good data is all from our, our countries, like from all the Europe, the US, the EU, Canada. And there are poor country, countries which don't have good data at all. So this is the completeness of data. And how do they manage the cause of data? So of course, they collect all available data, they correct for feasibility and bias, or they correct for the biases, and then they pass to the cause of death modeling. This comes into fact the whole amount of statistical modeling which is very, very intense. And I'll take it to you in a very simple way, but it's actually not very simple. So just to show you, first they use the space-time GPR model. They actually have multiple models. So the space-time GPR model is, to, I'll give you an example. It sounds very difficult. So you have data for Ireland for 2015. You have all the years. Whereas you have a neighboring country which has data for only 2005 and 10, <clears throat> nowhere in between. But you still want to project that data. You want to show that, OK, I, I'm going to show the data, if, even if it's not there. But you're comparing amongst neighbors. So that comes space. What is space here? The space is the neighborhood. And the time here is the year. So you are trying to project something across space and time. It's also called a spatiotemporal Gaussian process regression. It's that big, but it's space-time GPR model. So some countries where you have no data, like if you have Ghana and Nigeria, Ghana has data, Nigeria doesn't have data, then you try, if they are neighboring countries, you try to predict one based on the other. And when we actually talked about this to the trainers who taught us that how can you predict about a country where there is no data? So they told us that some data is better than no data. When you ask researchers across the world, there is always a problem with data. You don't have data. But that doesn't mean you don't give predictions about anything across the country. At least the country has some data across time points. And you can match whether really it does match with the data from 2005 and 10 to see if whatever we predicted in between matches or not. But for some countries where there is no data, absolutely zero, you can not take the risk of predicting. So this was the most interesting part of their work so this is the cause of death ensemble model so all of you know netflix everybody has an account i think i have an netflix account so for netflix when you go into netflix you might see that they tell you what do you want shelly what do you want to watch i'll be like oh no this is all stupid what they're suggesting me i want something else and sometimes it might happen i might just log in and see oh yeah this is so interesting this is what i wanted to watch so Netflix in 2009 gave a prize of 1 million US dollar to a person who can make an algorithm to say 
what am I going to watch next, provided they know what I'm watching previously. So, and then one group came up with an algorithm, which was a, com which was a combination of very simple algorithm, not complex at all. And they said that, oh, this is the model which can tell, which is predicting. That is the ensemble model. So they used this ensemble model in their cause of death modeling. This ensemble model, so what were the lessons which they learned? The lesson was the more diverse the pool, the better. So the more number of models, simple models to combine together, is, it's better. And simple weighting schemes are better than complex schemes. So you don't need to have complex weighting schemes just to have a huge complex algorithm. You can have simple things combined together to give you the best results. And an ensemble model is not the first time to be used here. It's been used across the world in a variety of fields, in computer engineering and other fields as well. The quad correct. So quad correct is cause of death correction. What is, you can understand what it means. The bag doesn't fit the clothes, and then you arrange everything and put them together. It fits everything. How does it happen? And why do we need to do cord correct? We need to do it because sometimes predicted deaths are not equal to death from all causes in a mortality envelope. So in that case, we need to adjust for the excess or the number of less deaths which we are seeing. How do we adjust? This looks very complex, but it is not so complex. So I'll show you how we do it. So, sorry. So this is the before correction, this number of deaths from cirrhosis. And this is the total uncorrected deaths, that is addition of all these four. And this is the total deaths from mortality. See that these two does not match each other. They're not the same, they're different numbers. So how do we calculate this corrected, sorry, this pointer is, the corrected deaths? What we do is total deaths from the mortality envelope divided by total corrected deaths into whichever one we want to correct, cirrhosis. That gives rise to this number. When you add up all these four numbers after correction, you see it comes to the total mortality envelope deaths. So that's how you correct for the uncorrected number of deaths. So years of life lost to much premature mortality. So what is years of life lost to mortality? See, if you are at age zero, your age is zero, and if you die at age zero, how many years of life have you lost? You have lost 86.6 years of your life. If you die at 5, you lose 81.8 years of your life. If you die at 100, you just lose at 1.4 years of your life. So that is years of life lost. And how is it calculated? It is cal calculated by the number of deaths at that particular age into the life expectancy. So this is the life expectancy. That's how we calculate it. So, example, this is the age number of deaths at that particular age, the standard life expectancy at that age. So this death into standard life expectancy is equal to zero. And so you calculate all this and I've just summed up and put it up here. So total years of life lost for cirrhosis is a summation of all of this. Okay. Non-fatal burden estimation. <clears throat> so years of life lived with disability. So a sequela is a combination of health states. So a, a, a years of life lost is prevalence of a particular sequela into the disability weight of that health state. So just to explain to you why I'm talking about sequela, why do we need to talk about? So one particular disease has multiple sequela working together. So if you have diabetes, you might have other problems like kidney, kidney dysfunction or water retention. I'm not sure about the medical things working together. But yeah, they'll have different factors. So when you are calculating the years of life lived with disability from diabetes, you need to have all the sequelas, the years lived with disability for all the sequelas combined together. You can't just say, oh yeah, so that the person has kidney retention, water retention, so that's the only factor. You have to have all of them together to say the years of lived with disability from kidney is this. And sequela list is mutually exclusive, so one does not one cannot be with another, but they are collectively exhaustive. So you have to have all the sequela list together to give the years of life lived with disability for one particular disease. And how is it calculated? So if you remember, it's prevalence into disability weight. So the prevalence is given this and the disability weight into the years lived with disability. So this is individual, you multiply prevalence into disability weight, get this value. I've just added and summed it up here. And the DALI is the most important of all of the story. The DALI is a sum of the years of life lost 
plus the years lived with disability. So years of life lost we calculated earlier. Disability just for life years were calculated, uh, sorry, years of lived with disability were calculated earlier. So we just add both of them together and we see how many total disability adjusted life years for cirrhosis was there for that particular year. So it's very simple. Now, the most important thing of the global burden of disease study was this comparative risk assessment framework. That was what brought a lot of controversy as well, because earlier people used to think every death is from one cause. So all the causes, when they are combined together, would add up to 100%. But GBD came into terms and they said, no, it's not the reality. No person dies from only one, one single factor acting. There are a lot of multiple factors working together. So there are two ways to estimate burden. One is a categorical one. The categorical one is one death, one cause. So all factors add up to 100%, which is not a reflection of reality, which cannot be a reality. And the other is counterfactual distribution. What is counterfactual distribution? So what would be the burden if my exposure is reduced to the minimum level? Means I, I smoke for 10 cigarettes a day and I stop smoking cigarette at, in a, on particular day, zero, what does my burden reduce to? That is the theoretical minimum level. So these estimates do not need to add up to 100% at all because there are multiple factors working together. A person who smokes can also take in drugs, can also take in alcohol, and you cannot separate each of the factors together because they are working together. So you have not 100% addition for this, and it can also exceed by quite a margin. It need, need not be just like, oh, it's not 100%, so maybe 105. It can be more than that. So there is over here, there, there's no distinction between risks and causes. So they consider risk and causes as the same thing. So this was considered to be a better way of saying how we are estimating burden rather than the one single factor contribution. And how do we choose theoretical minimum? So some it can be zero ex exposure. No smoking at all is zero exposure. But some factors you cannot say it's zero. Blood pressure can never be zero. BMI cannot be zero. So in that case, we have to have a low, lowest level which will characterize, okay, so this level can be zero and this cannot be zero. So some example could be a diet low in fruit. So what is the theoretical minimum level for this risk factor? So if you don't have 200 to 400 grams per day, then you are contributing to some burden. Or if your diet, is, diet has sodium of more than five, one to five grams per day, so quite a big boundary, then you are risking yourself and you are risking and putting some burden. So that is a minimum theoretical level which it was contributing. Risk attribution. Risk attribution is done by attributable burden, which is a Burden metrics into the population attributable fraction. So an example. So the population attributable fraction for ischemic heart disease due to smoking. So you see there is a smoking prevalence of 0.58. Relative risk of ischemic heart disease for a smoker is 2.95. That it's, it's, uh, and the relative risk category for a non-smoker is 1. So the formula looks very difficult to understand, I know. But it is not difficult. See, if you have that sign is summation and x is 0 to 1. So when you put 0 in the, relation, in the equation, you have relative risk at no risk, at, at no smoking into prevalence at no smoking. And at 1, you have relative risk at absolute amount of smoke, like the person is smoking and the prevalence at smoking. So that is how it's calculated. If you, if you like do it again, you will find out why these numbers come from. And this is the depression attributable deaths. To give you an example of it, so the prevalence at each age group is given here. The formula for population attributable fraction is given here. That's P is the prevalence. The relative risk is 18.6. And you calculate the path from here. And you calculate the attributable deaths from this formula. Okay. So, forecasting. This is a very important part of any public health policy system. You cannot just say what we are now. We have to say what we are going to go in 10 years. Where are we in 10 years? And everybody is interested in that 10-year scenario, 20-year scenario. So how did IHME do the forecasting procedure? So what they did was 
they had data from across, of course, from 1990 to 2013, when they're publishing 2013. What they did is they picked up 1990 to 2005 and they predicted 2006 to 13 with that data. And they saw which of the models which they were using best fit that data. The, the minute they found that model that it fits the best 2006 to 13, they used that whole that model for the whole of the data to predict in future like 2020 or 30 whichever they are interested in so they put 1990 2005 in one predicted 6 to 13 whichever model suited their criteria brought that back and predicted the future again that was simple so just to give you a little bit of what ireland in terms of burden of disease is so in 1990 systolic blood pressure had the highest rank in 2013 we are nowhere improving like we are at the high blood pressure is still at the highest level. That's what the big controversy about uh, salt intake as well. We have made improvements in uh, reducing cardiovascular diseases from 1999 to 2013, but cancers have gone up again. So in that terms, we need to have more about more policies in terms of controlling neoplasms. And this is the most, yeah. So there was smoking at the highest rank in 1990. And you see, diet high in processed meat has got up. And it's ranking at the top for all the years lived with disability. So that was the big hype about carcinog the World Health Organization saying that processed meat is carcinogenic. And this also showed in the population. You see that here, you see there are cancers going up. And here you see processed meat. So you can make a story out of this like processed meat could be carcinogenic as well. So these are the things which we have to think about, you have to talk about, you have to know what is happening in Ireland, just so that the government comes into picture and makes policy and helps. So just to show you a bit of the IHME website. So this is the Global Burden of Disease Study. And you have, this is the workshop which I attended, <laughs> and then <laughs> and there is the global health data exchange so you can click here to download and access data which they have and then if you want detailed data sometimes you might, some data are not being able you won't, won't be able to access them because they have been collected from countries where have, they have restricted access so you might just write an email to them and they might give you the data but you have to just I think fill in a form and that is it and if you want to If you want to go into details of data, then you can go here. It is on cloud. There are some data available here. And you can actually download them from here. By death, by location, all cause mortality, life expectancy. Then just go back. Okay. You also have these data visualization tools where you have GBD Compare, GBD Public Health England cause of death visualization which you can play around if you want and see if it's of any help to you there are a lot of fellowships as well if you are really interested in them and like post bachelor fellowships training programs which they constantly take you can take part in and you have their latest updated uh, publications always being updated here the day it gets published in lancet it's up here so you can just click over if you're really interested in any of the burden of disease study from here and one more thing. Um, oh, no, I think that's fine, yeah. That should be fine. Okay, so the future progress, oh. The future progress in this field is that the Irish data for the latest years would be modeled according to the above methodologies. So collaboration has already been established with Professor Mohsen Nagavi, Professor Theo Voss, Dr. Jed Blur, and Dr. Tom Achoki. So I've been talking to them even after the course, and they're very interested in collaborating with us. And uh, Dr. Zuber is uh, already on the GBD collaboration list now. And I have already talked to IHME about possible co-authorships and they're interested. They have told me to send the paper as soon as I can write it. So I'll write and you can send it and they'll find uh, co-authors on that paper if possible. So that has already been agreed upon. And if you can find me, <laughs> so, uh, Ali did not find me, so I'm quite sure you people won't find me as well. And I would like to thank Dr. Zuber, Professor Ivan, Professor Kevin Balanda, HRB, CHDR for funding and also partial funding was done by the Melbourne School of Public Health and Centre for Health Trends. 
and IHME for all the study materials. Thank you.